Let's close our eyes for prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for another privilege of coming before you to study your word. We thank you for your power and your presence with us today as we study your word. We know that without the illumination of the Spirit, we'll read the Bible as any other book and we'll get nothing out of it. Therefore, Lord, we're pleading with you that you bless us with your presence and the presence of the Holy Spirit tonight to breathe on your word, to teach us your word, to apply your word to our hearts, that we may profit by the reading and the study of your word in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, that you bless every one of us together as we fellowship around your word today. In Jesus' name, we pray. We thank the Lord because we started the second epistle to Peter in our studies this time and the Lord is seeing us through to the very end and the conclusion of that epistle. I want to remind you that when Peter, by the inspiration of the Spirit of God, wrote this epistle to the believers, one, he wrote to the people that knew Jesus Christ. They knew Jesus Christ as Savior. That means they are turned away from their sins. They knew they couldn't save themselves because the Bible says, by the works of the law shall no man be saved. But they knew that Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary so that their sins will be forgiven, so that they will turn from death unto life, so that they will turn from condemnation unto justification. They had believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. And they had been integrated to the church of the living God. But a problem arose. Number one, they had persecution because of their faith in Christ. Not only that there was persecution, persecution was coming from without. Then from within, there was coffers, there were doubters, there were antichrists, false prophets rising up and wanting to turn them away from the purity of the faith they had received wanting to turn them away from their faith and expectation in the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the reason he wrote this second epistle to them. And you will see from the very first chapter, writing to them, he talked about grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of our Lord Jesus Christ. Then he led them to remember that they have become partakers of the divine nature. And because they were partakers of the divine nature, that holiness without which no man shall see the Lord had been revealed unto them. And they were to pursue and they were to possess that holiness that will keep their fellowship with the Lord here on earth and help them to enter into fellowship with the Lord in eternity. Then he told them how they will grow, what they will add to their faith. And he told them about virtue, told them about knowledge, about temperance, that's self-control, about patience, about godliness, brotherly kindness. And he told them, as you add all these things to the foundation that you have got, then you'll be solid as a Christian. And when the Lord will come, you'll be able to go with him. Then he wanted to assure them that as they preach the power of Christ, and they were preaching also the second coming of the Lord, they were not following cunningly devised fables. He said that. Because there were people already injecting doubt into their mind as to whether Jesus will come again or not. That's the reason he told them. He said, you shouldn't be taken by surprise that false prophets, false teachers, proclaiming the error that they are here today in the church. He said, because it had been prophesied of old, and now it is being fulfilled, and there shall be false teachers among you. The unfortunate thing he said is that these teachers of false doctrine will bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord. And then, unfortunately, many will follow their pernicious ways. Then he brought them back to the history of the children of Israel. That they shouldn't be surprised. There are many people that came out of the land of Egypt, but they were not able to get to the land of Canaan. He had to describe these false prophets to them. So that when those false prophets came, they'll be able to recognize them. And he told them about the lifestyle of those false prophets and the way of speaking of those false prophets. But then he said, they shouldn't be surprised. These are like dogs. These are like pigs. They were washed before. 
they've gone back into the mire. The vomit that came out of them, they went back to swallow again. And then he wanted to conclude the epistle. And he told them, I'm reaching the first epistle to you. I'm writing this second epistle to you so that you'll be steadfast, you'll be firm, you'll be able to hold on to the doctrine that you have learned. And it's not about the second coming of the Lord. Why is it so delayed? Why is it the Lord has not come? Then he told them, you must understand that one day with the Lord is like a thousand years. And a thousand years like one day. By the way, he told them, the Lord is patient, not willing that anybody should perish. The long-suffering of the Lord and the patience of the Lord is not because he cannot fulfill his prophecy and bring back Jesus again. It's because he's not willing that anybody should perish. That's why he, it appears the promise of the prophecy had been delayed. But he said, the day of the Lord will come. And when it comes, it will come like a thief in the night. Suddenly, unannounced, he will come. And when Jesus Christ comes, the heavens and the stars and the sun and the moon, everything will be melted away. Then he said, as a conclusion of this, seeing that all these things shall be so, what manner of men and women ought we to be in all holy conversation as we're looking for the fulfillment of the promise of God so that we'll be found in peace without spot and blameless. Then he cleared up the confusion that came to the minds of some of the people concerning the writings of Paul the Apostle. And he said, all those writings, the scriptures. And Paul the Apostle has emphasized the same doctrine and the same teaching of the coming of the Lord. Now he comes to the conclusion in the last two verses of the epistle, the last two verses of the chapter. Chapter 3 now, verse 17 and verse 18. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things, before, beware, lest ye also be led away with the arrow of the wicked fall from your own steadfastness, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. The Apostle Peter has now come to the climax and the conclusion of this second epistle. And his conclusion in giving us exhortation is based on the knowledge that we have received throughout the epistle. That's why I kind of revealed for you what he's been talking about. And then he says in verse 17, Ye therefore, the word therefore is building on what he had already said, what he had already taught, what he made clear from the very beginning. Then he said, Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, that is, you have known already, Christ is coming again. You have known already false prophets and false teachers will come. You have known already persecution, trouble, trials will come. You have known already there will be many people trying to persuade you to leave Christ and also to be taken away from the foundation of what you believe. Because you know this already, beware. Beware how? Beware of what? Beware of the deception of those false teachers and those false prophets. See that she know that false prophets and false teachers shall come in the last days. Beware. Knowing that false teachers shall bring in damnable heresies, be on your guard. Beware. Knowing that many shall follow their pernicious ways, their erroneous ways. Beware. Knowing that they will lead many people astray. For the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. Since you know that some will depart from the faith, beware and be on your guard that you will not be among the people that will be led astray. Knowing that the love of many shall wax cold. Be not overconfident. Beware. Knowing that the danger of covetousness and compromise will increase in the last days. Beware, lest your hearts be overcharged with suffering and drunkenness and with the cares of this life. 
And the Lord is telling us something that whenever you study the word of God, either you are reading by yourself or you are studying together with the people of God, your study should lead you to a practical step to ask yourself, as a result of what I've learned, what are the things I need to put in place in my life? What are the things that the Lord is cautioning me about? What is the result, the consequence of what I've learned now upon my life and my vigilance and my steadfastness and my resisting temptation? As a result of all that we have learned, we have to take some decisions. And the study of the word of God should not just meet us, leave us, and leave us as it found us. The knowledge of all that we have learned in Second Peter should lead us to watchfulness and to steadfastness. The possibility of backsliding should stir us up to watch and pray. Lest we we'll be led away and led astray with the error of the wicked and the error of the scoffers, the apostates and the scoffers. They pursue the believers and they labor to make the believers fall from their steadfastness. Satan is seeking whom he may devour. Antichrists and deceivers are many. That's what the Bible says. That's the reason why the Lord is calling us to watchfulness. Because the Antichrists are there. The false prophets are there. And they are not few in number. They are many in number. In 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2 verse 18. Little children, it is the last time. And as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. Not only that, there are many Antichrists, there are many false prophets. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they have God, because Many, notice that word, many, many false prophets have gone out into the world. In 2 John verse 7, 2 John verse 7, for many, again, again the word many, for many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. In Titus chapter 1, verses 10 and 11. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses. There are so many people that dedicate themselves to teaching error, to teaching false doctrine, and they will get to you and come to you anywhere you are. And they will not target you alone, but target your whole family. It says they subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not. For filthy Luther's sake, Luther's sake. In Matthew chapter 24, Matthew chapter 24, the very words of Jesus Christ himself. In verse 11, it tells us, And many false prophets shall rise, and shall deceive many. Many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. It's because of all this, and that these people will try to draw disciples after themselves. That's the reason the Lord is speaking to us and is saying, Beware. Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. To draw away disciples after them. And it's the reason, it is the reason why it says, Beware. Be on your guard. Be watchful. Be steadfast. Know what you believe. Know the word of God and understand that those false prophets will come and they will want to pull you out of your roots and they will want to add you to their number. In verse 31, that's why it says, Therefore, therefore, because they will arise and they will come to you and they will like to approach you and add you to their number, therefore, watch and remember 
that by the space of three years I ceased not to warn every one night and day of tears. And then the Bible tells us, Wherefore, let him that thinketh his standeth take heed, lest he fall. As we look at our study today, in Second Peter chapter 3, verses 17 and 18, we're looking at three points. Number one, caution against backsliding. Beware. Number two, commands concerning the steadfastness of believers. And then number three, commitment to spiritual growth by believers. Number one, read Second Peter chapter 3, verse 17. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware. Lest ye also be led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. And you'll see here that the apostle was talking about the possibility of falling, the possibility of backsliding. And he cautions us against that backsliding. And he says, because you know all these. He says, because you know that the false prophets and the false teachers will try to make you get away from the Lord. Beware, be very careful, be on your guard, and be vigilant, and resist the devil. You know these things, and you know it as you look at the watch of God. And you know there is a possibility of backsliding. Even the false prophets themselves, what does the New Testament say about them in chapter 2 of this, Second Peter that we're reading, that we're studying? It says, look at it, chapter 2, verse 1. But there were false prophets also among the people. Even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privately, privately, shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them. The Lord that bought them. The two they were purchased and bought by the blood of the Lamb. The price was paid for them. That's a particular time. When these false prophets too, they believe the Lord. But now they will deny the Lord that bought them. And then he'll bring upon themselves swift destruction. Then in the parable that Jesus gave, he said, those who received the word, that is the seed, upon the stony ground, they have no root in themselves, which for a while believe. That means they were believers. They were children of God. For a while, for a moment, they believe. But in time of temptation, they fall away. That shows the possibility is there that one can backslide. And then as Paul was writing to the Hebrews in chapter 4, he says, let us therefore labor to enter into that race, lest any man fall after the same manner of unbelief. After the same manner. He was referring to the example, after the same example of unbelief. He was referring to the example of the children of Israel. They were redeemed. They were purchased by the blood of the Lamb. And they came out of the land of Egypt. But they were not able to get to the land of Canaan because they did not continue to believe on the Lord. And then it says, Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and your election sure. For if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. And then that passage of scripture, Wherefore, let him that thinketh his standeth take heed, lest he fall. It's from the Old Testament to the New Testament who have been given warning upon warning upon warning that we shouldn't take our Christian lives for granted. You have believed the Lord, wonderful. You are born again, wonderful. You are a child of God, wonderful. But do you know, there were people that were children of God before us. And because they were not careful to remain steadfast in the Lord, because they were not careful to keep on to their faith, holding fast, holding firm, they fell away. That's why God Almighty himself warned the children of Israel. And he told them that they needed to beware, to take heed, lest after believing the Lord, after they had been saved, they fall away, they forget the Lord, and then they perish. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, from verse 11, Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 11. Here is God Almighty himself. One in these children of Israel, beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God, in not keeping his commandments. That means then, when it says, beware that you don't forget the Lord your God. Forgetting the Lord simply means that you don't keep his commandments. 
You're not conscious of his authority over you anymore. We can still do a lot of religious activities, a lot of religious things, but if we're not keeping the commandments of the Lord, we're forgetting the Lord. We may say that I still pray. I still come to church. I still do a lot of things. Of course, if I, were, if I didn't remember the Lord, why would I be doing this and doing this and doing this in the name of the Lord? My brother, my sister, if you forget the Lord, the evidence is you are not keeping the commandments of the Lord. Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God in not keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes, which I command thee this day, lest when thou art eating and art full, and hast built goodly houses and dwelt therein, and when thy herds and thy flocks multiply, and thy silver and thy gold is multiplied, and all that thou hast is multiplied, then thine heart be lifted up, and thou forget the Lord thy God, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt, from the house of bondage. Here you find God himself warning the people. Matthew chapter 7. Reading from verse 15, Matthew chapter 7, verse 15. Beware of false prophets. Here is the Lord Jesus Christ in his sermon on the mount. One in his own people, his own disciples, the people that believed on him. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a coral tree bringeth forth an evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. A child of God will not bring forth evil fruit. A prophet called of God, a teacher called of God, a preacher called of God, a good tree will not bring forth evil doctrine, evil fruit. Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth forth not good fruit is hewn down, is cut down, and is cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits, it shall know them. Number one, by the fruit of their own character, by their lifestyle. You will know those false prophets by the carelessness in their lives, by the covetousness in their lives, by the irregularities in their conversation, by their behavior. You will know them, number two, by the kind of converts they have. The kind of followers they have. The fruit of their ministry. By their fruit, you will know them. Not everyone in verse 21 that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Prophecy is not enough. Gifts of the Spirit, not enough. Healing the sick. Deliverance ministry, not enough. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name I've cast out devils. And in thy name I've done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Here you find the Lord himself warning his own people. And now in First Timothy chapter 4, First Timothy chapter 4, we've seen the warning and the caution given to us by the Father. And also now by the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now by the Spirit of God himself. First Timothy chapter 4, reading from verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits, and doctrines of devils. That's the reason the caution and the exhortation and the encouragement comes in verses 15 and 16. Meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them, that their profiting may appear to all. Take heed, that means beware. Be on your guard. Be careful. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. Beware. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. 
They were less these people come to you with argument, with logic, with philosophical reasoning. Beware lest anyone, any of these false prophets, any of these false teachers, beware lest they come to you and begin to have these arguments <coughs> and through philosophy and vain deceit. They deceive you after the tradition of men, after the rudiment of the world, and not after Christ. Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3 from verse 12. It tells us there, take heed, beware again, take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. This were brethren, take heed, brethren. They were born again. They were children of God. But the warning, the caution, that they ought to beware and take heed. So that even after they have believed on the Lord, there will not be in any of them a heart of unbelief in departing, going away from the Lord. Do you ever take that to heart? Do you ever think about it at all? Do you ever meditate on the fact that I ought to be careful, I have to watch, I have to pray, I have to gird myself, fence around myself, so that the error of the wicked will not get at me and make me to depart from the Lord. I have to be very careful that my heart, my faith, my love, my attention is not drawn away from the Lord, concentrating on other things. Take it, brethren. These are children of God. Lest there be in any of you, any of you means anyone, anyone. I don't, don't, don't get so settled and feel, you know, I'm born again. I'm a child of God. I've done this, I've done this, I'll be here, I'll be here. It can never happen to me. I can never fall. You take heed, lest there come in any of you an evil heart. That evil heart that was not there before. And then something now is introduced into your heart, introduced into your system, introduced into your behavior. Something that was not there before. And then your heart, an evil heart now, departs and goes away from the living God. But... Exhort one another daily. Encourage one another daily. Caution one another daily. Warn one another daily. Encourage and exhort one another. Talk to one another. Share with one another every day while it is called today. Lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. You know, sin hardens people's hearts. And it says you ought to be very careful lest you are hardened. Through the deceitfulness of sin. Because it says in verse 14, For we are made partakers of Christ. On this condition, made partakers of Christ, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. That's the challenge the Lord is giving us. What are the things that pull people's hearts away from the Lord? Many things. Let me show you just a few. In First Timothy chapter 6, First Timothy chapter 6, reading from verse 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness with contentment is great gain. We thank the Lord for those of you who are here and those of you who have been coming regularly. You've been able to make up time to come to study the word of God. But there are some people that contentment is not part of their Christian lives. It's business making money making money business and all they think about is how to get more how to get more how to get more as you look at what they've got today they've got much much more than they ever had before but they're not satisfied yet there's no contentment and because of wanting to get more wanting to get more wanting to get more they don't have time to sharpen their spiritual iron they don't have time to sharpen themselves spiritually and to come to the Lord regularly and study the Word of God. They don't have time to examine their lives. They don't have time to prepare for the coming of the Lord. It's just to make money and to make money and to make money. And it says, for we brought nothing into this world. And it is certain that we're carrying nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. Then it tells us in verse 9, but they that will be rich... They that will be rich. They that want money at all cost. Those that put money as number one in their lives. I'll be there as much, as long as I can make all the money I can make. 
And once I see that there's another opening, another avenue whereby I can make more money, doesn't matter. I don't care what happens. I will leave and go and make money. They that will be rich, they fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful laws which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil. The love of money is the root of all evil. Wanting to make money out of everything. Out of even our service to the Lord. Wanting to make money out of it. Out of our commitment in the house of God. Wanting to make money out of it. Out of any project, anything going on. Wonderful. That project, already they are calculating how much I can make out of it. For the love of money is the root of all evil. Which while some coveted after. They have erred from the faith. Erred from the faith. Departed from the faith. Falling away from the faith. And pierced themselves through with many sorrows. They pierced themselves through with many sorrows. That's why the Lord Jesus Christ wants us. In Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21. Reading first in verse 8 before you go down to verse 34. 21 verse 8. And he said, take heed that ye be not deceived. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ. And the time draweth near. Go ye not therefore after them. And you'll wonder when you see some believers, Christians, after they have read these warnings over and over. Then the time comes in their lives that the devil begins to expand and begins to describe to them, look at your condition, look at this and look at this. Then they begin to pity themselves. And exactly what the Lord had said, don't do, don't go after them. That's exactly what they do. In the time when the devil begins to explain to them, are you not losing much? Look at this and look at that in your life. But the Lord is warning us, we ought to be on our guard. We ought to fence around ourselves. We ought to take it, we ought to beware, so that we're not led away with the error of the wicked in verse 34. It says in verse 34, and take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with suffering and drunkenness and the cares of this life. And the cares of this life. And the cares of this life. And so that they come upon you unawares. For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch ye therefore. Be on your guard. Beware. Take it. Watch ye therefore. And pray always. That ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these sins that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul the Apostle, inspired by the Spirit of God, reminds us. Of the history of the children of Israel. Already you know that he has written to us in Romans and he has said, These things are written for time and they are written for our learning, upon whom the ends of the world are come. He repeats that same thing in chapter 10. First Corinthians chapter 10, from verse 1. Moreover, brethren, talking to believers, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. And the world baptized unto Moses in the clouds and in the sea. And did all eat the same spiritual meat. And did all drink the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. They had experience with the Lord. And then he says, but with many of them. But with many of them. God was not well pleased. For they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now, these things were our examples. To the intent we should not lose after evil things. As they lost it, we believers, we should not have our desire, our sight, our love, our interest on the things of the world that pull the minds of people away from the Lord. Neither be ye idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and to drink, and they rose up to play. Now that let us commit fornication. Corinthians, I hear some of you already have committed fornication. Neither let us commit fornication, Corinthians. I hear that one of you even went into his father's wife, dirty, dirty, dirty behavior, immoral sin, it will drag you to hell. Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed, and it fell in one day, three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted, and were destroyed of serpents. Neither 
What's the next word? Amen. Tell me out loud. Amen. Here we are. If we don't steal, if we don't kill, if we don't commit abortion, if we don't commit fornication and adultery, but the evil thing that the devil has given into us and put into our hands and we embraced it, not knowing that these can also take us away from the kingdom of God. I don't commit fornication, but you murmur, but you complain, but you criticize. Nothing the church does, nothing your brother does, nothing your sister does is ever good. But you murmur concerning the doctrine, concerning the way of the Lord. But you murmur. I'm born again, but you murmur. I'm a child of God, but you murmur. Grumbling, grumbling, grumbling in your heart and also between friend and friend and in the families, but you murmur. And it says, if these kind of things continue, that it is going to take us away from the kingdom of God. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and they were destroyed of the destroyer. Now, all this happened unto them. For example, and they are reaching for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Unless we should say, that's them. Those people, they must have been careless. They didn't know what they were doing. That's why they must say, as for me, I will never. Uh -uh. Verse 12. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth. Therefore, wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth. Take heed, lest he fall. You'll see that in all these passages we have read, God himself cautions them and is cautioning us against backsliding. Beware. Our Lord Jesus Christ wants them and wants us against backsliding. Beware. The Holy Spirit speaketh expressly of the reality and the danger of backsliding in these last days. Beware. The apostles sound an unmistakable alarm that many will backslide and many will be deceived and many will be led astray. Beware. We see it happen in our days. People we never thought could leave the Lord. People we never thought will abandon sound doctrine. People we never thought will ever go astray. We see them backsliding and falling apart and falling away and going away from their steadfastness. Beware. We see many that are wiser than we are. They were stronger than we are. And they were more consecrated than we are. They are falling and backsliding. Beware. If we are watchful and prayerful, if we are humble and dependent upon God's grace, then he is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Now, he gives us commandment. Look at this, 2 Peter chapter 3. I'm reading to you again in verse 17. Commands concerning the steadfastness of believers. Point number two. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing that ye know these things before, beware, lest ye also, being led astray, being led away, with the error of the wicked fall from your own steadfastness. Now that we are aware that it is possible for our love and our zeal to wax cold and be dampened, it is now giving us exhortation and challenging us to be steadfast. Now that we know the negative and the destructive influence backsliders may have on us as believers, it's giving us the exhortation, stand fast, be steadfast in resisting the devil and resisting all his messengers. As we read the handwriting on the wall, and we see the signs of our times, and we see that our security against backsliding only depends on if we hold fast and stand firm and resist all temptations and we refuse to listen to the unfaithful backsliding ones, those who are forsaken the Lord, and we remain steadfast in spite of every wind of false doctrine. As we see that, then it calls us and cautions us and challenges us to beware and to be very careful and to be steadfast in the Lord. There are many preachers that teach that there is something called eternal security, that believers are eternally secured. And that it is impossible for true believers to ever fall from grace and be eventually lost forever. We know many preachers preach that, but the whole Bible reveals to us of the possibility of backsliding. Many clear, plain verses of scripture prove that these preachers are wrong. The words of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ clearly teach that believers can backslide and fall from grace and be eternally lost. This is the reason for many warnings and commandments for believers in the Bible. 
you and I, we must hold on to the truth firmly and not allow ourselves to be deceived, to be led into error. We must not allow the flesh or the world to make us fall. Of course, the grace of God is available. And if we rely on that grace of God, we can stand firm to the end. And I pray we will stand in Jesus' name. What does it take if we're going to stand? What does it take if we're going to remain steadfast to the end and we're not going to be led away with the error of the wicked? Well, it is what it takes. Look at the scriptures in 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 and verse 9. Be sober. Be vigilant. Have you ever thought about those words in your own life? Are you sober? Are you thoughtful? Are you vigilant? Do you watch? Do you ever guard yourself? Are you careful not to mix so freely with those who want to lead you astray? Messengers of the devil? Be sober. Be vigilant. Are you just carefree and careless? A friend to every false preacher, every false teacher, carefree and careless. I don't want to be so serious and so fanatical. I don't want to be so careful, so heavenly minded and be no earthly good. I don't want to be so strict and so strict that I just drive away everybody from my life. They have their own decisions to take. If they are backsliding, if they have gone away from the Lord, that's their business, but they're still my friends. They can take decisions, whatever decisions they want to take, and they can go to any fellowship they want to go to, and they can listen to any false prophet they want to listen to, and they can go anywhere they want to go. That, that's their business. For me, I am free. I'm not, you know, these kind of uh, holy, holy people that are shielding themselves, and they're no friends to anybody. They want to get to heaven, get to heaven, and they drive everybody away. I'm not like that. Uh, you are not like that. That's danger to your life. Be sober. And be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a running lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith. You resist the devil on purpose, and you resist his messengers on purpose, and you resist all the false doctrines coming from the false teachers on purpose, whom resist steadfast in the faith. If you really want to get to heaven and you know the importance of heaven in your life and you know that destiny, your destiny is going to be determined by whom you are fellowshipping with, you'll not just be so carefree and so careless. And of course, you know, sometimes uh, we believers, please uh, listen. Uh, look at, for me, for example, now, it's very difficult, I think, for any false teacher to come. And then twist my thoughts and twist my mind and make me backslide and make me believe error. Because I will go back to the Bible. It's very difficult for a false prophet to come and, uh, you know, just teach me something within 10 minutes or one hour. Even if we move together or whatever, for me, because of the study of the Bible, it's very difficult for them to deceive me. But I'm still very careful. Not just for myself, but for the rest of the believers. If I became so free and, you know, so careless in my relationship with everybody, and I said, well, since they cannot deceive me, in fact, I don't think they will even try. Therefore, I still want to be loving, I want to be tolerant, I want to be friendly, and I want to, you know, show everybody that, uh, well, whatever you are believing, that's your part, but I love you all the same. The danger is there are some believers that will see me with such people. And those believers, they will not come and ask me questions. Whether I'm just showing love to them, I'm just trying to draw them near to teach them something in their thoughts, in their mind. They will say, uh -uh, it means that this fellow may not be too bad after all. It means that this fellow may not have gone astray too much after all because our pastor, our leader is uh, friendly with them. And they may not deceive me, but those people will be deceived. That's the reason why. Even if they cannot deceive me, I still have to be sober. I still have to be vigilant. I still have to watch my relationship with the people that are preaching whatever they are preaching. The same thing with you. And some people are looking up to me. There are some people that are looking up to you. And whatever you do, they are saying, well, if uh, this person has really gone astray, if this person is not right, brother so-and-so, respected brother so-and-so, respected sister so-and-so, would not have been so free with them. That's the reason why, even if they cannot deceive you, even if they cannot lead you astray, you'll still be sober, you'll still be vigilant, you'll want to avoid them so that 
your example and relationship with them will not lead other people astray, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. And then he tells us in Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4, reading verses 1 and 2. Hebrews 4, verse 1 and 2. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise be left us of entering into his rest. Any of you should seem to come short of it. Come short of it. And sometimes it's very painful when we take examination. And then the cutoff mark is there. And we just dropped by one point or two points. And we could just have made it with a little more effort. But we miss it. And sometimes there are people that will miss heaven like that. Just a little point. Just a little carefulness. Just a little caution. Just a little commitment. Just a little consecration. They would have made it. But they fall short. Just a little bit. How many people of those children of Israel were near to the border of the land of Canaan, the land of promise and the land of rest, but they fell short just a little point. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, being not mixed with faith in them that heard it. In verse 11, let us labor therefore to enter into, into rest, into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief in verse 12 for the word of god is quick and powerful sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and the marrows and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens jesus christ the son of god let us let us let us hold fast our profession. That's what we have to do. So that we don't miss it eventually. These are commandments from the Lord concerning the steadfastness of believers in Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. Philippians 1, verse 27. Only let your conversation be as it becomes the gospel of Christ. That is, your manner of life. As it becomes, as it befits, as it suits the gospel of Christ, your manner of life, your behavior, your character, your profession, your interaction, your relationship with people. Only let it be as it becomes, as it feeds the gospel of Christ. Ask yourself, your friends, does it be, do they befeed Christians? Your relationship, your interaction, is it something befeeding the believers? Does it befeed the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ? And your intentions and your aspirations and your ambition and the things that you do and the thoughts of your heart and your imagination and your plans, do they befit the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ? If we put the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ black or white, written very clearly on one side and your lifestyle and your conversation and your behavior and your character and your plans and your imagination and your discussions with your fellow brother, your fellow sister and your discussions with the opposite sex, men and women, women and men, if we put it on the other side and we compare, does your life befit the gospel of Jesus Christ? That's what the Lord is calling us to so that the lives we live, the behavior we manifest, the actions of our hand, the character that we project will befit, will match the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Only let your conversation be as it becomes the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, and in nothing be terrified by your adversaries, by your enemies, by your persecutors, by the worldly-minded people, which is to them an evident token of, per of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 
is challenging us and commanding us to steadfastness. And in our steadfastness, here is what the Lord is, is calling us to. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 21, it says, Prove all things. Don't just suck in everything those preachers say. Those friends, what they say, don't just swallow everything. I've got this, can you listen to this? Don't just accept it like that. Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. And abstain from all appearance of evil. Abstain from all appearance of evil. And sometimes it surprises you. Uh, for some of us who have been worshipping here for a long time. Some of us who have been fellowshipping here. I've been learning the word of God here. And we've been sharing together the word of God. And sometimes you challenge a brother, a beloved brother in our midst, and you say, hey, Brother, uh, we're hearing that uh, you are too close to this uh, lady, you are too close to this sister. Uh, you, uh, that's what I don't like about this, our district, about this, our people. They gossip too much. Eh? Because they see me with sister so and so, eh, that means now that something is taking place, abstain from all appearance of evil. That's the reason the Lord is cautioning us. That's the reason the Lord is warning us. Abstain from all appearance of evil. You might not have done evil. You might not have gone into any sin. But as the people are reporting and they are talking about ah, what is happening between so and so and such and such. You don't just say, well, that's the problem in our district. They talk too much and they gossip too much. You are the cause of the problem. You will abstain. If you don't have any secret thing, any secret agenda, why is it difficult for you to abstain and to get off that thing that is making other people to stumble? And then in verse 23, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God, your whole spirit and your whole soul and your body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. Then he tells us in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and in verse 13. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse, verse 13. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God has from the beginning chosen you to salvation. But remember, through sanctification. He has chosen you through sanctification of the spirit and believe of the truth whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our lord jesus christ therefore brethren stand fast are you chosen stand fast have you been called stand fast are you saved stand fast have you passed through the blood the second time stand fast have you crossed the river the second time? River, the Red Sea, you cross that after you are born again. Now you cross River Jordan after you are circumcised and you are sanctified. Have you had that second work of grace and you have been purified and that Adamic nature has been dealt with? You are saved and you are sanctified. That's not the end. Stand fast. Therefore, brethren, stand fast. Hold the traditions, that's the word of God you have been taught, which we have been taught, whether by word or by our epistle. In 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 13, it says, Hold fast the form of sound words, which thou hast heard of me, in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. That good thing which was committed unto thee. Keep. Don't throw it away. Keep it. Don't play with it. Keep it. That good thing, the word of God, the word of life eternal, that calls you to live a life that is glorifying to the Lord, a life that befits the gospel of Christ. Keep it. It's been committed to your hand. Keep it by the Holy Ghost, which dwelleth in us. Revelation chapter 3. In Revelation chapter 3, reading from verse 11. Here is the Lord Jesus Christ sending a message to the church. And here is the message he sent to the church. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. And the Lord is challenging us and calling us to hold that fast which we have already. Have you got salvation? Hold it fast. Any business that will take that salvation from you, drop the business. Hold your salvation fast. Holiness and sanctification. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification. 
holiness. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. You see the Lord without money, without success, without prosperity, even without healing, even without wife, even without children. You, you can see the Lord. But this commodity, this spiritual entity, this important thing, you can see the Lord without traveling to America. You can see the Lord without traveling overseas. You can see the Lord without having an American visa. Don't let American visa or traveling or money or dollar or pound sterling or business or getting married or having children or having healing or having deliverance. Don't let it take, don't let all those things take away from you. The real thing that is very important without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. You can get to heaven without having a position in the church, without having title in the church, without being appointed to be bishop or archbishop or coordinator or group coordinator or any leader. You can get to heaven without position. Don't let, I must be this in the church, I must be that in the church, this must be given to me. Don't let that make you lose the holiness that will get you to heaven. And many people in the pursuit of, I must have this, I must grab this, I must have that. In the pursuit of all those things, they lose the holiness. And they don't hold fast anymore. Their salvation or their sanctification or the life they ought to have that will lead them unto life eternal. That's why the Lord is telling us all those things that will take away from you, the essential sin, the indispensable sin, all those things that will take away from you, your tickets to heaven, Drop all doses and look away from them. It says in verse 11, Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast, that, no, that which you have, that no man take your crown. Him that overcometh, will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God, and the same, and the name of the city of my God, which is new Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven, out of heaven and from God. And I will write upon him my new name. He that has an ear, I pray you'll have an ear to hear. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. You'll see how the Lord is commanding us and cautioning us and pleading with us so that we'll be able to get to heaven at last. Number three, point number three, commitment to spiritual growth by believers. Believers who really want to follow the Lord faithfully. Believers who don't count any other thing as essential, as important, except just their fellowship with God here on earth and fellowship with God in eternity. The commitment of such believers to spiritual growth Let's look at this last verse. It says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, But grow in grace, grow in grace, and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. And it is commandment, it is a security against backsliding, commitment to spiritual growth. If we will take this commandment seriously, we take it to heart, to grow in grace. You wake up in the morning, Lord, help me today to grow in grace. You are coming to church. Oh, Lord, I'm coming. I'm going to church now. We're going to the Bible study now. Help me. Help me. As a result of going to this Bible study, to grow in grace. We're going for a Sunday worship today, and we're going to have Sunday scripture. And before you leave home, you've read the Sunday scripture, and you've memorized the memory verse. Oh, Lord, today, help me. There is one thing I want. I want to draw closer to you. Help me to grow in grace. Any step I'm taking, any work I'm doing, any day that arises, what I'm aiming at, what I'm dreaming of, what I'm ambitious of, it's not the money, it's not this, it's not that. Oh Lord, help me today. The yearning, the desire, the ambition, the aspiration of my heart to grow in grace. If you are like that, you will not backslide. Your love will increase instead of waxing cold if you are like that. You'll be continually more zealous instead of becoming lukewarm. If you're like that, you will daily be living the overcoming life instead of being overcome by sin, by the flesh, and by the world. If you're like that, if it is your desire, if it is your passion, if it is your interest to grow in grace, this is a necessary commandment. Christian grace and Christian virtue has the possibility of growth in our lives. But what are we going to do? Number one, we read the word of God. 
We read the Word of God. And not just to read so that I'll say, I read the Bible today. You know, you're in a hurry. The money and the business and the appointment is more important. But not to say, I didn't read the Bible. Then I just open and I read one or two verses. And then, oh Lord, thank you today. Watch over me and I'm going. Let this business come through. And you are up. Not that one. Not that one. You're reading as somebody that knows that this is spiritual food. And I need to take it and eat it and digest it. You read the word of God. Number two, you apply it to your life every day. Number three, you pray so that you can draw close to God every day. Number four, you are endeavoring to increase in love, increase in faith, increase in holiness, increase in your consecration, increase in self-denial, increase in your faithfulness, in your humility, you're increasing in praying, in soul winning, in Christ-likeness every day. And that's why we will not backslide. When we take that commandment of God seriously, and I want the increase of Christ's likeness in my life every day, no one can grow in Christian virtue and Christian grace without the definite desire and deliberate commitment to the commandment of the Lord, grow in grace. How do we grow in grace? In First Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2, reading to you from verse 1. Wherefore, laying aside... All malice, all gal, all hypocrisies, all envies, all evil speakers, as newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the world, that she may grow thereby. And sometimes you'll find a particular friend, a brother, a sister. And as you look at this brother or sister, he's becoming lean and lean and lean. And then you are concerned for your friend, your brother, your sister. Say, brother, I'm sorry to ask you this. I know this is your personal life, but it looks like you are, you know, getting leaner and leaner every day. Is it that there's no money to buy good food? Are you not eating? And then he says, uh, uh, well, to, to tell you the real truth, I'm surprised myself because I've been, I've been eating, in fact, I eat even more than normal. And yet, the more I eat and the leaner, the leaner I grow. You say, why don't you check up? Maybe there's something. And eventually, the fellow checks up, and then there is a particular disease that this individual did not know. That although this individual, she has been eating and eating and eating, because of the disease in the system, in the body, she is going leaner and leaner. She is not growing in the physical. The same thing. When the disease of malice is there, oh, we can eat and eat and come to the Bible study and go to the revival hour and have a personal quiet time and come to the Sunday worship and read and study the Bible and pray and have quiet time. And the more we're we are taking the spiritual food, the more we're reading the Bible, the more we're taking the milk of the Word of God, and the more we're even delving into it with concordance and everything, the leaner and leaner and leaner we're growing in our spirit because there is a disease in our system. A spiritual disease that no matter how much we study the word of God, we remain carnal, we remain worldly. And our lives do not show that there is any spiritual growth. That's why it says, if you want to grow, it's wonderful to study the word of God. It's wonderful to take and to, to have within you the sincere milk of the word of God that you'll grow thereby. But before you do that, lay aside malice, guile, hypocrisy. And envy, jealousy, and all evil speaking. Lay those aside, then take the sincere milk of the word of God and see how you will grow. It says, A, so be that ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. In First Corinthians chapter 14, talking about growth. There are levels of the Christian life and there are levels of maturity. And he wants us to grow from the baby stage and grow into maturity. In First Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, reading from verse 20. Brethren, be not children in understanding. Grow up. Grow up. Understand spiritual matters. Grow. Understand the purpose of God. Grow. Understand the calling of God upon your life. Grow. Understand maturity in behavior. Grow up. It says, brethren, in this verse 20, it says, be not children in understanding. How be each in malice be children? That means that he is, uh, you know, if it's about offense, so and so did this against me, 
Oh, children don't have diaries. They write those things in. And children don't keep records of, he did that yesterday. I'll show him. I'll wait now. I'll be quiet now. But next month, after he has forgotten he did that thing, I'll strike. Children don't do that. Children don't remember. After a few minutes, they are playing again. And it says, in malice, be children. But in understanding, be men. That's growing. It wants us to grow in our understanding. In First John chapter 2. First John chapter 2, verse 15. Reading from verse 12. In verse 12, it says, I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. Then I write unto you, fathers, because you have known him. That is from the beginning. I write unto you, young men, because ye have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you, little children, because ye have known the father. You see the little children. You see the young men. You see the fathers. There is growth. There is growth. There is development. There is maturity. Going on to maturity. So we don't remain at the same level every time. And our understanding of today is just like we understood two, three years ago. Our behavior today is just like we behaved five years ago. Our maturity today is just like our maturity ten years ago. No, little children and young men and fathers. And then in verse 14, I'm preaching unto you. Fathers, because you have known him, that is from the beginning. I'm preaching unto you, young men, because you are strong. That's growth. When you become strong, and the word of God abideth in you, and you have overcome the wicked one. When you are now overcoming, you are victorious. And the kind of temptations that got you down five years ago will not get you down today. You are, you are moving forward, and you are making progress in your Christian life, and you are growing in Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 13, 14, and 15. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man. Make progress. Make progress. Don't stay at the same point, at the same level. Let there be growth so that we can come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That Ye be, we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the sledge of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive but speaking the truth in love may grow up grow up grow up into him not apart from him into him into all the characters of christ into all the attitudes of christ into the vision of christ into what into the will of the lord may grow up into him in all things which is the head even christ and then isaiah tells us in isaiah chapter 40 verse 28 the place of prayer the, pray, the place of communion with the Lord as we grow before the Lord. In Isaiah chapter 40, reading from verse 28, Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard, that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint. And to them that have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Now in Second Peter chapter 1. Second Peter chapter 1. It now tells us uh, the systematic steps we take so that we can be growing. It tells us to grow in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. After we've had the saving knowledge of Christ, we're born again. We need to know him more and more and more. And then as we know him more, and we know of uh, the power of his resurrection, more, we become stronger in the Lord and stronger in the might of the Lord. It tells us these are the things we ought to take care in our lives. In Second Peter chapter 1, verse 5. And beside this, give in all diligence. Make some effort. Add to your faith. Add to your faith. Don't stay at the same place, marking time. Add to your faith. Virtue. After that virtue, add knowledge. And to knowledge, add temperance. And to temperance, add patience. Patience. 
patience. And to patience, godliness. And to godliness, brotherly kindness. Brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, charity. Now, for if these things be in you and abound and increase and grow, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off, and has forgotten that was purged from his old sins. And there are some people that have forgotten about their salvation. They just take it for granted. And are not making effort to keep that salvation and to grow in the knowledge of the Lord and to grow in their spiritual Christian experiences anymore. They have forgotten that they were even saved. They have forgotten all the consecrations they made to the Lord when they were seeking the Lord to be saved or to be sanctified. Wherefore, the rather, my brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. I pray we will not fall. And so for so, an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We've come to the conclusion of Second Peter. And in this conclusion of the Second Peter, it's challenging us that if all that we've studied from chapter 1 up till the end of chapter 3, if everything is not going to be in vain, if you're coming and coming for fellowship and for worship and for Bible study and for revival, and if you're staying with the people of God in the church, it's not going to be a waste of time. It says, ye therefore, beloved, seeing that ye know these things before, beware, be careful, be sober, be on your guard and be very careful, beware, take it, lest ye also be led away with the arrow of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. But now before he leaves us and before he dismisses us and before he allows us to go away, he says, while you are going, remember, there's an assignment I'm giving to you. Grow in grace and grow in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And then let your life be always giving him glory, both now and then when we meet in heaven forever. Let's rise up and pray. Let's be steadfast in the Lord. Let's be steadfast in the Lord. If the deceivers have deceived us and we're backsliding and we've gone away from the Lord, let's come back to the Lord. If we have moved away from our steadfastness, let's call upon the Lord to give us grace to come back. If the original commitment we had, the original conviction we had, the original fervency we had, and the original surrender, absolute surrender that we had, if we don't have it anymore, let's call upon the name of the Lord, that the Lord himself, the Lord himself will restore us Back to the original fervency, original consecration, original commitment. And now we promise the Lord, O oh Lord, by your grace, O oh Lord, by your grace, O oh Lord, by your grace, I'll be steadfast, holding on to what I already have, so that nobody will take away from you your crown, so that nobody will take away from you all your commitment with the Lord. Don't be careless and carefree. Don't be careless and carefree. Don't allow the devil to just blindfold you. Make you to forget the importance of holding on. Holding on to your salvation. Holding on to the sanctification experience that the Lord has given you. Don't exchange that experience that will, is your ticket for heaven. Don't exchange that for the mundane things of this world.
hold fast that which you have until Christ comes. Don't let anybody take your crown.